The Crofter by Goodby Archer Patrick Sergeant, hold a moment, said the bailiff raising his right hand in the air. The sergeant drew up his horse next to the bailiff who sat uncomfortably in his saddle, and stared down at the little farm in the valley below. We are entering the North Island Dales. That croft belongs to Hardy Nettles, he farms all the land in this valley between the South End Downs and the High Country. The crofters up here are poor, but they do raise a great number of sheep, known for their fine wool and excellent meat. Be on your guard. Two years ago the sheriff sent his excisemen into this valley to collect the earl's tax, but none returned. It was rumored they were attacked by highwaymen, supporters of the earl's brother in exile, on their way back south. Then last year, another group of excisemen entered this valley, never to return. The earl suspects treason, and it is my job to find its source, and root it out, before it spreads throughout the island. I will begin here, with this croft, said the bailiff pointing at the little farm below. The sergeant stretched his neck, and looked down at the little stone house, covered with a freshly thatched roof. Next to the front door, an old man sat on a wooden stool, pulling wool from a basket. Why it don't look like much to me, grunted the sergeant. Looks can be deceiving, said the bailiff as he dismounted. The two men led their horses down the steep mountain path, until they reached the open pastures on the valley floor where they paused to rest. This is a curious thing, said the bailiff bending down, and pulling out a tuft of grass from the ground. What's that? asked the sergeant. The grass in this pasture is long, and hasn't been grazed in quite a while. What's more, there's no sign of livestock anywhere on this farm except for the few head of sheep penned up behind the croft, he said looking around. They might be grazing up in the high country, proffered the sergeant. No, it's too early. There is still snow up in the mountains. Perhaps we'll learn more from the crofter, said the bailiff as he mounted his horse. The two men rode at a slow pace over the gently rolling pasture, and headed towards the little stone house. The crofter looked up from his chores, and squinting his eyes, stared as the riders approached. From behind the house, a young woman appeared, carrying a basket full of wool, freshly shorn from the few sheep held in a nearby pen. What have we here? whistled the sergeant. Let's have none of that, barked the bailiff. At least not until we have dragged some news from them. The bailiff dismounted his horse and handed his reins over to the sergeant. Are you hardy nettles? He asked the thin, bony man sitting on a stool outside the cottage door. Who wants to know? He snarled in response. I am the bailiff of this island, and an officer of the Earl. You are two years in arrears on your excises, said the bailiff in an official voice. Excises? What kind of excises? Asked the crofter. The bailiff looked at the small pen holding a handful of sheep and asked, Where is all your livestock? I didn't notice any grazing on your pastures. They're gone. I had twenty head of sheep before you lot came and took them all, two years ago, snorted the crofter. Evidently not all of them, said the bailiff pointing at the small flock of sheep held in the pen. Those? Why they're just a few strays that came my way. The crofter said with a shrug. The young woman re-emerged from behind the cottage, carrying another basket of wool. Viewing the visitors with suspicion, she stood next to the cottage door and lowered the basket to the ground. Ain't you a pretty little thing, the sergeant called out menacingly. Daughter, go in the house, ordered the crofter. Where is your wife? asked the bailiff. She died last spring. It were the black lung that took her, the crofter said in a low voice. Do you have any other children? Asked the bailiff. I have two sons, the crofter responded. And where are they now? Asked the bailiff. 
They're both serving in the king's navy. Both against their will, he added. That's strange. The press gangs don't venture this far inland, said the bailiff with a hint of doubt in his voice. They was at sea fishing for herring when they ran straight into a king's ship. Their boat was seized, the catch confiscated, and the crew was pressed into service. That were over three years ago. They don't even know that their mother's dead, said the crofter in a cold voice. It is their duty to serve the king, just as it is your duty to serve the earl, said the bailiff with a stern voice before turning to the sergeant. Have a look around the farm. Keep your eyes open for anything unusual, he said while taking the reins to his own horse and tying them around a fence post. Pulling up a stool, he sat next to the crofter and stared hard into his face. Two years ago, we sent a group of excisemen into this valley, and they never returned, he said studying the crofter's face. I heard they was set upon by the earl's brother, murmured the crofter. Are you a supporter of the earl's brother? And his claim to the island? Asked the bailiff. I don't support any man's claim to this land but my own, replied the crofter defiantly. The bailiff leaned forward on the stool, his hands grasping his knees, until he was nearly face to face with the crofter. Last year, another group of excisemen came into this valley, and they too disappeared. What do you know about that? Asked the bailiff. I don't know nothing about that, replied the crofter. Small beads of sweat were starting to form on his forehead, and his hands shook visibly. The earl thinks treason is afoot. Do you know how we deal with treason? By hanging traitors. Hang them by the neck until they are dead. That's how we deal with treason, said the bailiff straightening his back. There ain't nothing here. Nothing but these few sheep, said the sergeant dismounting his horse and tying the reins around a fence post. Those sheep will come with us, as partial payment for taxes owing, said the bailiff rising from the stool. Those sheep are all I have, shouted the crofter as he jumped to his feet. The sergeant reached for the musket slung over his shoulder, and using the butt end, struck the crofter in the stomach, forcing him to fall back onto the stool. How about a glass of ale for you and your sergeant? Asked the young woman stepping out of the house, and holding two frothy glasses. Daughter, what's the matter with you? They come to steal my livestock, and you offer them the last of my ale, shouted the crofter sitting bent over on the stool. Father, where are your manners? They are our guests, and should be treated as such, she responded firmly. Your daughter knows her place. You would do well to listen to her advice. Thank you, my dear, I will take a glass, said the bailiff reaching out his hand. How's about giving us a kiss? said the sergeant in a low guttural voice. Sergeant, I will not warn you again, said the bailiff as he handed him a glass. It ain't fair. It ain't right. The earl takes away all I own as taxes, and what do I get in return? moaned the crofter still bent over and clutching his stomach. The earl is your sovereign lord. He gives you his protection, said the bailiff. Protection? Protection from what? groaned the crofter. Protection from our enemies. From those that want to do us wrong. From those who want to misuse us, and destroy our values and our lives. From vandals and pirates, and all the earl's enemies, said the bailiff, his voice steadily rising in pitch. Vandals? There ain't no vandals round here. And as for pirates, Nobody has seen them since the days of my granddad. What does the earl want with my sheep anyway? Asked the crofter still sitting on the stool, but no longer bent over. Don't you know we're at war? Barked the sergeant, before gulping the last of his ale. War? Who are we at war with? Asked the crofter. The earl has launched a campaign against the wild folk across the ocean answered the bailiff dismissively. Wild folk? What does he want with them? Wondered the crofter. 
They have rejected the Earl's offer of friendship. They will not listen to his good advice, nor will they accept the gifts we sent to them. The Earl has tried to show the superiority of our way of life. The advantages that our machines and crafts would bring to them, but they steadfastly refused. When the Earl sent our priests to instruct the wild folk in the true faith, they turned them away from their villages and settlements. Surely, you cannot expect the Earl to take such an injury without some form of retaliation, said the bailiff, pausing only to drink a long draught of ale. I don't see what this has to do with me. Nor my sheep, protested the crofter. War is a costly business. Armies require a great number of men, men who need to be fed clothed and supplied with weapons. Ships must be built to carry them, and the engines of war across the sea. Cannon powder and shot are not purchased cheaply. We are all in this together. We must all pay our share, said the bailiff in a harsh voice. The Earl has no business poking his nose in the wild folks' affairs. They've never done nothing to us, protested the crofter. That was the position of the previous Earl, before he was replaced by his younger brother, who holds a more acceptable view of the matter, said the bailiff. It may be that the Earl could learn a thing or two, from his older brother, murmured the crofter. Any talk against the war is treason, shouted the sergeant. You must forgive the sergeant. He is a soldier, and war is his livelihood. But he is quite right, that sort of talk is treasonous. And likely to get a noose around your neck, said the bailiff. It is well known that the men of the North Dales are supporters of the Earl's brother. Tell us what you know about the missing exciseman, and we will leave you in peace. Tell us all you know. And you may keep your livestock, said the bailiff waving his hand toward the sheep pen. Suddenly, the sheep began to bleed and kick wildly. The crofter sat quietly on the stool. His eyes were wide. His face was drained of all color, and glistening with beads of sweat. I cannot help you, he stammered. No. It is you who needs help. Your silence amounts to a confession. It is clear to me, that you know what happened to the missing exciseman. Perhaps you even had a hand in it, and yet you refuse to speak. And by doing so, you give aid to the Earl's enemies, and are yourself complicit in treason. Never mind. The jailers of Tingwall know how to pull a confession out of a closed mouth. Sergeant. Seize that man. He's coming back with us. Ordered the bailiff. No. No. My father is nothing but a simple farmer. He knows nothing of the world. Screamed the young woman as she flung herself against the sergeant in a vain effort to hold him back. Grabbing hold of both her wrists, the sergeant pried her loose, and pushed her violently to the ground. Springing to his feet, the crofter lunged at the sergeant, who reacted quickly by stepping to one side, and smashing the butt of his musket down on his assailant's back. Stay down you filthy maggot, he shouted at the crofter. And as for that poxy wench. But before he could finish his sentence, the sergeant's voice had changed, becoming deep and raspy. His words were slurred and incomprehensible. The bailiff watched in horror as the sergeant fell to the ground, grasping his throat and writhing in pain, his face twisted and distorted. A hideous creaking sound resonated from the sergeant's skull, as the bones in his face elongated, and formed a long muzzle. The ears on both sides of his narrow skull grew in size and turned pointed, while thick, curly tufts of wool, sprung up on his head and all over his body. What devilry is this, shouted the bailiff, as he tried to back away. But he only managed to take a few steps before falling to the ground. The thin legs with backward-facing knees could no longer support his half-human body. The bailiff's screams of pain and fear gradually changed in both intensity and tone, until nothing but the bleeding sound of a sheep could be heard. Rising to his feet, the crofter reached down to his daughter and pulled her off the ground. They stood in silence, dusted themselves off, and watched the two sheep wander about the pasture, 
dragging their recently discarded clothes behind them. The crofter followed the two sheep and picked up the scattered bits of clothing. Daughter, put these two in the pen with the others while I burn these rags, he said with a snort. What about the horses? She asked. I'll take them up to the high country and set them loose. They can find their own way back home, he said after a pause. The crofter sat in front of the fireplace, and watched the flames flicker and grow with each piece of clothing he added. Pausing a moment, he pulled a long wooden pipe from his pocket, reached down to the fire, picked up a small burning twig, and held it to the pipe's bowl. Taking a long draft from the pipe, he blew a gray cloud out his nose, adding more smoke to the room. Through the haze he noticed a dark shadow standing in the doorway. Father, you know more will come, said the shape. Aye, they will come. You best brew up some more of that ale, he said, taking another draft from his pipe.